Okay, good afternoon and welcome everybody to webinar week number eight, Willow, I think. I think right. it's week number eight that we're on right now. I'm uh, starting to, to lose sense of time a little bit. Um, day number one, obviously, here on a Monday. Delighted today uh, to have Mr. Ken Lola with us. And Ken is going to, to dive into a very esteemed history of um, life as a NCAA Division I college coach, um, in addition to obviously sharing some some incredible insights, both as a as a player and then working within uh, within the youth national team setup. So a real treat for both players and coaches that are listening now or or in the future. Um, I have Mr. Mark Wilson alongside me, Tom Shields. So uh, the people listening live with us now, obviously we will extend an invite to you guys to pop up um, with questions should you have them in the chat function. You can just simply type a, a question in there and, and myself or Mark will try and try and filter that into to the conversation and, and the questions that we have lined up for Ken today. Um, before we get into the conversation, just again to, to both players and coaches listening, just want to make sure that um, you guys turn your attention if you haven't seen it across our social media channels yet to the Active Minutes project that we at Beyond Pulse launched last week. So we're supported there with our friends from, from Nike Soccer. So players, if you're looking for ways to demonstrate to your coaches how hard you're working to, to own your lockdown and um, to improve every day, uh, please check out that. And, and obviously coaches, if, if you're looking for ways to keep inspiring your players to, to be accountable during what we've termed separation season, please uh, please consider checking out, uh, checking out the information that's available on www.beyondpulse.com. So um, back to the conversation, Ken, Thank you ever so much, first and foremost, for taking a, an hour out of your time this Monday. We're absolutely delighted to be able to welcome you here. So if you could, for perhaps the people that, that might be a little less familiar with, with you, um, your quite incredible story in the game, if, if you wouldn't mind just sharing a, a, a quick introduction to, to your career, that would be wonderful. Sure. Well, first of all, thanks so much for having me on, uh, watching what you guys are doing. Uh, the guests you've had on, but most importantly, what's uh, impressive about what you're doing is uh, it is about development. It is about youth development, coaching development. It's about the development of the game. And um, I give you guys a lot of credit because you're putting a lot of time and effort and investing um, in it as well, which um, the, the big benefactors is going to be obviously the players and the coaches, but our country. So we so much appreciate what you're doing. And uh, thank you for for having me on. For for me, my career started in in New Jersey, and I mention that because a big influence on me were the coaches and and the people I grew up around. And because it was New Jersey, there was this melting pot. I had uh, Scottish coaches, German coaches, uh, South American coaches, and and at that time, the Cosmos were in their heyday with. Beckenbauer and Pelé and Bogicevic and so many unbelievable players coming through and all of this, this culture of soccer had a massive influence on me growing up that I grew up with a, a passion for the game. And because of that, I, um, I grew up playing uh, around and with some very good players, but had some awesome coaches uh, growing up. And um, at that time, had the ability to play college soccer at Duke. And after Duke, there was no MLS and um, wanted to extend my career. And I think maybe a little bit of, of just prolonging maturity sometimes, but wanted to continue to play as long as I could. And uh, indoor soccer was the only game at the time. So I started, I started playing uh, indoor. And it was while I was playing indoor, I got involved with youth development with the club and started coaching a little bit and what a impact that had on my life is is understanding um, the power of the game in influencing people in their lives and I I caught another passion not only the playing aspect but then the, the coaching passion which started after I finished coaching and or after I finished, uh, finished playing started coaching and led to eventually uh, college soccer again, where I was a volunteer assistant at Duke for a year and um, got a, a job at an NAIA school, small school, a uh, thousand people in the school run by Benedictine monks, really neat school, and was there for about three years and um, learned a lot. I learned a lot in those three years. It was a situation where um, 
there was no assistant coach. Um, Tina and I, my wife and I, uh, really, we, we ran the whole program. We had to cut the field, line the field, wash the uniforms, uh, make the sandwiches. She drove run one van. I drove the other van. And um, we learned a lot um, in those three years just about coaching and, and especially about leadership. And um, from there, did well enough after three years to get an opportunity at a Division I school, the University of Akron, uh, and was there for 13 years. Uh, it was a program that had been struggling, had some history, but it had been struggling. Uh, and we were fortunate enough to bring them um, along and, and back into national prominence. And from there, I got the job at the University of Louisville in another program that had been struggling, had no history, and uh, was very blessed to also have success there, uh, 13 years there. And uh, December of 2018, de decided to release that. And in along those, uh, that period also had some awesome experiences with our national team. I got to uh, coach alongside Bruce Arena for a little bit. I did the um, uh, under 15 national team, under 15, under 16 national team for I think it was five or six years. Um, so I had a, a number of really good opportunities and experiences as well with our, our national programs too. Yeah, thank you ever so much for that, Ken, and, and the kind words that you shared at the start of it. Um, for the people listening now or, or later, obviously I, I think that the very humble explanation of, of Ken's background that he's just provided should should I hope excite you for what's for what's in store? And obviously we've we've spoken or we've titled this conversation, you know, about leading from the front, both as what you can do as a player and the advice that Ken will share with you guys, but also as you know the younger or the career coaches on the line. Um, obviously the the insight and the experience that Ken has to share is in many ways unparalleled. Um, obviously you've skipped over a few of the awards that you and and the team collected along the way there, Ken. Um, but we're in we're an incredible company, and like we said, we, we really thank you for for taking the time out to to share uh, to share the insight with us all today. So, Ken, I'm I'm going to start with with a conversation that's framed really around um, advice to to the to the younger players, um, but also perhaps characteristics that that you would encourage other coaches to look for um, in the players that they're selecting. So. The last few months, obviously, you might have seen that, that we've tried to frame this this introductory question around facets of, of inspiration and people that have motivated or inspired coaches as coaches or players, uh, teammates. So my question to you is: Could you give me um, could you give me an all time all star five aside team of of captains that you worked with, and and what specific what specific leadership quality was it about them? Um, that you think separated them from maybe some of their peers and I appreciate this is difficult we don't want to offend any anybody listening now um, obviously it is an esteemed career and there's there's not going to be a place for everybody as Willow's found out in a few five-a-side teams um, so, yeah Ken if if you could yeah you know um, I'm sure I, I could come up with uh, five um, but there were there were two in particular in my career um, that I think um, designated themselves and, and were a little bit different. And, and really there were, there were certain aspects for them as leaders, as captains, because when you're, when you're talking about recruiting and wanting people to be part of your team, there are certain characteristics I would absolutely say that we were looking for. But when you're talking about a captain, I think there's, there's a whole nother level. There's, uh, very specific, at least there was for me, and characteristics that I was looking for that would allow them to be very successful captains. Because the, uh, the responsibility of that, um, you know, the, the heaviness that that sometimes carried, it, it took a special individual to do it well. You, you can name people captains, but to be successful in it, it took certain characteristics. And the one word that comes to mind more than anything else was trust. That the, the trust needed to go both ways. We wanted to identify people. The captains were not always the best players, but they were, they were players that had built trust up, both with the coaching staff as well as with the team. And that 
the perspective of trust with the coaching staff, there were two areas that were really, really important. We we developed values that, that drove behaviors that we wanted to live by. And our job as coaches many times is to reinforce those behaviors every single day and everything that we're doing. And it was so, so important if these, these were values and behaviors that we believed in that these captains modeled that. Because if we were trying to reinforce these behaviors and they were acting outside of them, and then we would empower them as our leaders, it was contradictory. It didn't all line up. So first and foremost, we wanted people that were modeling the behaviors that we felt were important for us to be successful. The second aspect that trust-wise I, I thought that was really important was we wanted to make sure that they would echo our words, especially when we were not there. That if you had a captain that in the locker room were speaking against what we were saying, now we were chopping off our own legs. Now we were really compromising any of our words and any of our influence because we were then empowering our captains to speak against us. And it's really dangerous when you have leaders that are speaking against what the, the coaches are trying to communicate. So those were two areas for us that we felt that were extremely important. And we trusted not only that they were modeling the behaviors and, and we could see that a lot, but we had to be able to trust that they were gonna echo what we were gonna say, that they were gonna be on the same page. Right. And listen, it didn't mean that they always agreed with us because we we didn't want captains that just always agreed. We wanted them to come to us with questions or issues, but we didn't want them speaking against us within the team. And that would compromise what we were trying to do, our our um, our mission and our vision. On the other side of it, it was so important they had trust with the players. That, that the only way they could influence the players is that they built up trust. And if they had built up the trust, then they were gonna have influence. And we wanted to make sure that, that the captains weren't just ones that were lining up with us, but also had an influence with the players as well. And it was so important that they built up that trust. And, and trust is, it's difficult. Sometimes a player comes in and, and they're a very talented player and you wanna put them in a captain's position, but trust is something that is built up over time. It's kind of like um, a forest, right? A forest, it takes a long time to build up, but in one moment, one careless moment, it can burn down. So we wanted guys that had proven over time, that had built up the trust over time, that people that we can depend on and rely on, and not only from a coaching standpoint, but also with the players. And there were two guys that I felt one was at the University of Akron, Johan Moger, um, who is still working in the game. Um, he was uh, uh, international, came from France. And it was interesting for both of these individuals. They were both uh, similar in a lot of ways. They were both international. The other one was Tim Kubel, who most recently was at um, Louisville with us in, in my last few years. Both international and both when they came over did not necessarily buy into my vision. Right from the beginning, it wasn't clear that they were on the same page. They didn't trust, and it, here was the key, was I had to prove over time through consistency of giving the same communication, of modeling what I wanted them to, to, to live by, and then showing them I cared. I built up trust over time that you can see that eventually for both of them, they came to trust me and me them. And they grew into awesome leaders, tremendous leaders, and probably the two, uh, two best I experienced. And, and coincidentally, you know what? They also led some of the best teams I've had. Thank you for that, Ken. Um, I'm before we we build through obviously other other conversations. I'm just curious if you can extend upon, um, you know, for the value of the, the more the coaches listening and the players. But but what do you mean when you say you know modeling the behaviors that you're kind of that you're asking from them? When you say modeling your values, can you give me a, a couple of of examples and and also, you know, if you were if you were comfortable in sharing what those values were um, and if they were consistent from 
you know, from your first NAIA job all the way through until you left Louisville or whether they evolved over time? Well, to, to work backwards, they evolved. And, and the reason why they evolved is because I evolved. And um, there's a story about a Steve, Steve Kerr. He was uh, coaching the Golden State Warriors and they were uh, interviewing him about the culture at Golden State while NBA was was winning championships, dominating the NBA. And they said, you know, how, how did you develop the culture? What was it? And he said, well, before the first practice, I went home and I thought to myself, what were the values in my life that were important? What was it that I was living out on a regular basis? Because if I was going to have to ask them to live out certain values and certain behaviors, I better be modeling them. So, it is the same with me and, and any leader. I believe this is um, so, so important and so powerful is that we be living out the values and behaviors we're asking of our team. And that's why for me that they evolved over time. I felt early on um, a little bit naive, just assuming because I, I was never, to be honest with you, even with the good coaches I had, I never really had one that defined the value and the behavior so much and yet played on some very successful teams. I just assumed they'd take care of themselves. But I learned over time that I needed to be intentional with it, very purposeful with it. But I found that when, my, uh, when I started to evolve, when I started to grow, when I started to change, my philosophy changed, things I value change. And so it was at the end of the, my career, we came up with three values that I thought were most important for a successful team and probably had the longest standing run of my career of, of success. And it was, uh, first and foremost, it was relentless, re relentless effort. That um, I, be I believe that it's one of life's greatest principles is that you reap what you sow that if you want heat from the, the fireplace, you got to put the wood in first, right? If you, if you want to get something back, you got to put some effort in first. If you want a, a harvest, you got to sow the seeds. And it's, it's just simply that. And, and especially when you have massive goals, you need to put in a massive amount of effort. And it had to be relentless, not, not occasional. It had to be everything because what we knew was this, was that our, our, our character would define our culture and, and in effort, you cannot put it up on a shelf. If I went to class and I, um, I, I cut corners, it was gonna reflect my character. If I was in the dorm room and I was doing something that I shouldn't, it was gonna reflect my character. So, so we just assumed that it was relentless. It was everything and all the time that we gave our best effort. The second was mental toughness and mental toughness simply being um, to be able to focus on what was important, what we could control. And it was something we needed to train. What was our response? We find our situation, we were talking about this earlier, we find ourselves in a situation of great adversity right now, things have changed. And, and it isn't necessarily ever the event of what happened, it's all a matter of our response because our response will dictate what the outcome is. So mental toughness, we were constantly training their response to all situations. And it's not always negative. Sometimes it's positive. Sometimes you have some success, but what is your response to it will deter determine what your outcome. The third thing, and I think most importantly for any team sport is, is selfless spirit, is the willingness to give of ourselves for the good of the group that we take the eyes off of ourselves and put them on other people. That um, it's not necessarily that we think less of ourselves, but we think of ourselves less, right? And those are the people that we were um, looking for. That was the culture we wanted to create, the behaviors that are associated with those values we wanted to reinforce. And for our, um, our captains, they needed to, to model that. They needed to be the ones that were the hardest working. If we put a captain out there and he's cutting the corners on the, on the fitness exercise we're doing, it wasn't a good sign. If he was the first one to complain about um, 
being, you know, the, the, the flight being late for something, it wasn't a good sign. You know, if he was the first one to, to be looking out for himself, it wasn't a good sign. So, so those were the areas that we wanted them to model the behaviors because it made it even easier than to reinforce them to say, look, at, here's the most successful guys. And you know why they're successful? Guess what? They're modeling those behaviors. That's wonderful insight and, and thank you for sharing. I, uh, Kelly, I, I hope that your pen is on fire right now because there was some uh, some quite incredible little little comments there that I think many people will, will steal when we produce the summary of this. So um, Ken, thank you. I, I would just like to to kind of go back to, to what you said right at the start and the, the anecdote about Steve Kerr and um, John O'Sullivan, who's a, a dear friend of, of all of us. I, I think he spoke very similarly um, in in his book, Every Moment Matters, about those kind of ideas. And, and it was more for coaches to think, of, you know, how am I going to coach this team isn't necessarily what activities that I'm going to put out. It isn't if I'm going to use, you know, if I'm going to do fitness tests or play games, you know, but as you've said, the very intentional, very, auth uh, very authentic, very deliberate approach towards culture formation, relationship formation, um, and how we maintain certain standards and I think that's just it's such a critical thing that I, that I want all of the coaches on the line to to make sure that that kind of that resonated because um, it's, it's fascinating insight that you shared, Ken. So so thank you for that. Um, as we obviously as we go through this conversation, uh, we we do want to bounce around between both players and coaches. And and what I'd like is for you to speak to now that the players on the line that might harbour aspirations. You know, obviously the University of Akron and Louisville were both huge and hugely successful programs under your tenure uh, and, and your guidance. Um, could you speak over, you know, the, the couple of decades of experience of, of having people join programs of perhaps um, what, if you could name a couple of things that, that you, that you think might take the freshman by surprise or that you find you, you found yourself having to perhaps re-emphasize um, when people joined in terms of the importance of this or hey when you're a bright eyed bushy tailed senior in high school that might be at the, the top of the pecking order what now happens when you transition in so you know really kind of very open ended but a, a couple of a, a couple of pieces of advice for people that that obviously would like to to make a collegiate career for themselves sure the one you know the one thing that um, I don't know if they can prepare for, quite honestly, is that the college game, the season is so different than anything they probably experienced before. And what I mean by that, and we as college coaches have been trying to change it, but um, that the, the season starts in August and ends in December. And in that window, the, the you know, the best teams are, are playing 25 almost 30 games. And there is uh, too many in such a short period of time from the September 1st for when it starts the end of December, you're squeezing in a lot of matches in a short period of time. And I don't think anybody, especially, you know, playing in the academy right now has a schedule like that, that it's so cramped and so intense and are playing so many at a, in a short period of time. When you're, when you're playing almost every Wednesday and Saturday or, or Tuesday and Friday through the course of, of 12 or 14 weeks, it's heavy. And we've seen some of the uh, best international guys come in and suffer just because of the um, the repetition of intense matches over and over again without this ability to recover. There, there really is very little time, almost no time within the season recover. So it, it's, it's, um, it's a challenge in two ways. There's a, a physical challenge to it, but there's also a mental challenge to it. And it's something that uh, for freshmen coming in is one of the greatest challenges of maintaining that through the whole season. It's kind of like when they talk about college players going into the NBA, they say the hardest part is the longevity of it, right? They haven't mentally been through all season and sometimes it takes one for them to understand it and get used to it. So I think the same thing for, for college athletes, it's, it's um, very, very intense. And, and because of that, each match has such high significance, so they're fast-paced, 
um, a lot of substitution in many cases. And so the game never really slows down. So you're playing these over and over and over again. And likewise, every then training has so much um, emphasis on it. And, and also you're either preparing for the next one or trying to recover a little bit from the last one. So I think between the matches one and the training two, those are two areas over the long of it, it's hard to adjust and it's difficult because they probably haven't experienced anything like that before. The third thing I would say is just independence, is being away on your own for the first time of having that independence. And there are some that are better prepared. We've seen some that maybe have gone on and, and been a part of academy already living away from home, used to making decisions, used to taking that responsibility of when to get up, I need to be at certain places, being on time, um, all those things, just even freedom of having to make choices based on having freedom. Those are things, unless they've been in that situation, are now are things that they have to adjust to and um, are important, really important, because um, it will dictate your habits, will dictate your success. And if you come in as a freshman and haven't established habits of being independent, of being self-sufficient, it's, it's tough to be successful. I think, Ken, that a former guest and dear friend of ours, uh, Jerry McEwen, um, who's the boys director at the ID2 program. Jerry speaks, and it's a different type of leadership, right, Ken? That you're the leader of your, you're the CEO of your own company, right? Your soccer career is your company. You are in charge of the decisions that you make. And, and absolutely, while you say that there is no, there is no way to recreate the same type of intense environment that they're walking into, what, what they could be accountable for is how they prepare to best to best accommodate and you know to best deal with with that type of pressure um and we were having a an offline conversation earlier about grit and and mental toughness and you know those attributes that you know you're hearing it's going to be players i'm kind of speaking directly to you now you're hearing it's going to be you know quite arduous and a grind um you know those those habit formations that that, that you can kind of create now to help prepare you as best as possible for that are going to be key, right? And the same types of behaviors that Ken has spoken about that, that might have been critical to his culture, can you go and find ways of building that into your you know, daily and weekly life right now? Because if you can do that, if you can take accountability and responsibility now, knowing what you want to try to achieve down the line, hopefully that very difficult transition, even if it's five or 10% easier, it, you know, those marginal gains could be significant. So um, yeah, I just, uh, again, it's, it's really important advice. And again, just as a call to action for the players, you know, please listen and, and take in these words because it's, it's a lifetime of experience that, it, that where it's coming from. Willow, you've, uh, you've unmuted, so jump yeah. in, mate. Yeah, um, you know, it, it resonates with me from a former, being at a former club of mine, um, you know, Manchester United was something that everything Ken's talking about encompassed in terms of habit forming. And I think one of the, the important things to remember is as a player and, and Ken, hopefully you'll, well, whether you'll agree with me on this or not, I don't know. Um, you expect them to make mistakes. Part of going through your environment is a journey of growth. So all of the habit forming, all of the, the discipline you're looking to build, um, the simple in principle, but extremely hard in practice um, bits you're trying to develop around the players that will serve them well on the field in any circumstance. Do you see players grow more from making mistakes within that environment? Um, and what is the process you work through with some of the players that have been through that environment to help them understand why it's OK to make those mistakes, but in more importantly, why it's important for them to learn from them? What what a great question that is, Mark. Um, and it, I believe the essence of coaching in that um, the understanding that uh, growth happens by getting out of your comfort zone, that um, there are growth rings. And if you're in that growth ring of order where um, you're comfortable and everything is uh, in order, there's very little growth there or, or none. But when you step out of that into um, a place of complexity where things aren't in order, where you're, you're not really sure of what the outcome's gonna be, 
that's where the growth happens. And that's part of coaching is how do you stretch them? How do you get them out of their comfort zone? How do you get them to try things that they haven't tried before, knowing that if they try them, the outcome might not be successful, that they might fail. But that's the essence of it is to get them outside of that. How do you get them to do it? Partly by constructing, how do we construct an activity that it forces them to have to do something a little bit different, a little bit better, a little bit faster maybe than what they've done in the past. But part of it is also to create an environment where there's trust, where they can be vulnerable, where there's a freedom to it that they know that they're not going to be crucified because of the mistake that they made. We always, as long as they were acting in the behaviors that we wanted to reinforce, mistakes are going to happen sometimes. But don't be because we're not working harder, not because we're not mentally tough or focusing on what's important or because we're being selfish rather than selfless. As long as we're acting within those behaviors, we wanted to encourage them to, to grow out of their comfort zone where they are, to try new things, knowing that failure is simply part of the growth. That's the essence of coaching is keeping their confidence up while also pushing them out of their comfort zone to try and do new things because that's where the growth is. What an awesome question that is. And I, I believe it's the art of coaching. And that answer there tells me I would have absolutely loved playing for you, Ken. Absolutely <laughs> bang on. Awesome. I think that, I, I would have loved to have you as a player. Is it true? I don't even know. <laughs> Maybe. Um, Ken, it, it's a great segue into to kind of the next question that I have behind the importance of character in the recruiting process. So obviously you spoke earlier about captains and, and they're, they have a, a very unique and, um, and specific set of, of responsibilities, but, but could you please just extend the, the part of the conversation you've just had about what, what you look for from players in terms of the type of person you want to bring into your environment? I, I assume that if you're going to be, you know, one that does try to stretch them and, and maybe display, we, we speak about safe uncertainty and creating those kind of cultures where you, you are always stretched and, um, how, how important is it for players to demonstrate, you know, emotional flexibility to be prepared to, to put, you spoke earlier about like a we before me concept, like the needs of the team before the needs of myself. Can you just speak to, you know, to the importance of those characteristics and maybe the work that you did on, on trying to understand the person you were bringing into your program, you know, sure. in addition to the player? Sure. It was, it was critical that we, we knew them and in knowing them of building a relationship with them, um, how critical it was that, um, like we talked about earlier, trust that in coming in, we knew them enough to trust them, to ask them to be a part of our program. And also that they were coming here because they trusted us to help them reach their goals and potential and what they wanted to achieve not just in soccer, but in life. So it was important that we we built that relationship in the recruiting process. Obviously, if we felt that relentless effort and mental strength and selfless spirit were important to us, we were evaluating on that. We go, you know, I work with companies right now, and this is interesting, where um, they bring people in based on talent. And then they'll evaluate them on their behavior. And it doesn't make sense that if they're gonna evaluate them on their behavior, they need to then bring them in based on their behavior, right? So it's gotta be congruent that if we're gonna evaluate them on their be their ability to live out the behaviors that, that we value, we sh probably should be recruiting them on those behaviors as well. And certainly we wanted talented guys. That was absolutely had to be a part of the equation. But we couldn't compromise the behaviors for the talent. We couldn't compromise the character for the talent. Because I, I always knew this. We, if we had a talented player that was not living out good behaviors, they were always going to underachieve. And if we had somebody that was less talented but living out the right behaviors, they were always going to exceed expectations. 
And as a coach, I would much rather have guys on my team that were exceeding expectations because I always wanted to have a good idea, a comfort level with what we were putting on the field. If it was up or down or you never knew, it was difficult. So in the recruiting process, I felt it was important. If we were going to ask these guys to live out these behaviors, we recruited on that and talent as well. Above and beyond that, I think one of the key ingredients is coachability. Is that people are willing to receive information and grow from it. That if, if they're not um, humble, if they don't have the humility, if they don't believe that they need to receive information to grow, it's going to be very difficult in the environment that we create for them to be successful. And there have been moments where we found kids coming into our environment, we, we thought we had it nailed or, or maybe we, we didn't do enough uh, homework on it. They come in and they're not coachable. And after a couple of years, we say, well, listen, this is obviously not the environment for you then. Because if you're not willing to receive the information we're giving you, if you're not trusting in, in, in the guidance we're giving you, then obviously you need to find somewhere else where you trust in their guidance. And, and, that, I thought, for me, was the key, was their ability to be coachable, receive information, take the information, and then not only take it, but then apply it. Because there's a lot of people that may hear it, but never try to apply it into their lives. And I thought that was critical, critical for that. The other, the other is, is simply this strong desire to want to grow the strong desire to want to be better, the strong desire to want to be their best. We, we were always looking for guys that had um, massive dreams, big visions, uh, goals they wanted to attain. And we were willing, we said in the recruiting process, listen, we want to partner with you on this. That we're, we're going to join you with this, whatever the goals are. There were some we had to expand their brains a little bit more and help them see beyond where they were seeing. But in the end, it was our responsibility to partner with them and help them grow to reach whatever their goals were. Man, what we never did was talk them down from a goal. We would always then, you know, make sure that we we're a partner to help them reach it. Uh, again, it's it's just it's fascinating hearing you speak, and I think Willow, I'm I'm right there with you. It's I think it's clearly and um, maybe both. Robbie and Campbell can attest to the, the quality of the environments that you created for your players because it certainly sounds like it would have been a, a fascinating experience. And um, players, I just again, I, I'm always conscious of trying to make sure that key key little bits of insight don't get overlooked. And and I want you to hear that that obviously yes, ability as Ken said, you need to be you know superb little soccer players for sure. But the importance of those you know the soft skills and the character pieces are ultimately what's defining you know defining your journey and defining your success once you reach a, an institution of the likes that that, that can obviously was responsible for running um and it's just it is so critical to to be willing to embrace the messages that that your coaches give you and wherever you are i think sometimes can we spoke just before we went live of sometimes players perhaps you you don't the insight that you're getting doesn't quite resonate in a moment and it's only kind of on reflection maybe sometimes after you've experienced some growth that, that, that the penny drops but i'm hoping that, that you can hear you know the importance of responding in moments of adversity the, the you know the importance of you know having those kind of aspirational big dreams um the goals to chase and the willingness to to always you know we use the phrase be better tomorrow than you are today right that kind of that mentality in every walk of life is, is so critical um ken without wanting to to, to knock this too much, um, just 30 seconds if you could, there's younger players listening right now that perhaps are maybe a little, a, a little naively unaware of the, the, the character that, or the personality that they can, they can promote to the world via social media. Um, can you just give them a quick word of caution on, on what that needs to look like in the modern day? Yeah, ab absolutely. Um that we we were tracking social media and we needed to because again if we were going to invest and and not just invest from a scholarship standpoint but if we were going to ask somebody to be a part of our program we were asking them to be a part of our family and so the investment of time um 
and our energies, we wanted to make sure we knew who they were. Um, so uh, we were absolutely tracking social media as well. And if there was anything inappropriate, anything that didn't line up with who we were um, wanting and expecting, especially from a character standpoint, uh, we absolutely made note of it. And uh, it's um, it's all out there. You can't hide it. And you think that maybe somebody's not looking. You think that, um, well, somebody's not going to see this. Um, again, as I, as I said earlier, there's two aspects of it. One is, is that you put it out there for the world to see. But even if you don't put it out there for the world to see, that if you're doing something inappropriate, if you're saying something inappropriate, if you're acting inappropriate, it's still going to affect your character and who you are. So it's one thing that you announce it to the world. It's another, even if you're doing it behind closed doors, you're still not building up that athlete and that person that you need to be to be successful in life. So ultimately, you know what? You may deceive for a little bit, but you can only deceive so long. And for you to be successful in life, again, it's doing the right things even when people aren't looking. Yeah, perfect. And um, I, Willow, again, we, we speak about this all the time and, and we've probably said this phrase numerous times on these, these conversations, but you know, you, your character will define you way more than your talent ever will, right? It will, your talent will get you so far, your character and your mentality will kind of take you over, over the edge. So please players, um, please listen. And again, I think it speaks, we had Jack Barnby on last week who grew up with, you know, Paul Pogba and Jesse Lingard, but also Ravel Morrison. And today I think Wayne Rooney came out in the press and was speaking about how Ravel Morrison nutmeg Vidic three times and, you know, in, in one minute in a practice session and, and the, the players, you know, talent in abundance, unequivocal, but the character piece again is a real world example um, at the highest level was, was ultimately what he, he struggled with the most and, and perhaps has had a career as a result of it that is way below where it could have gone up. Quickly, Ken, yeah, the importance of self-awareness. It gets me thinking about the importance of self-awareness. And I think I went through a period in my career where the stereotypical who I was supposed to be overtook who I really was as a person. And that became a problem for me because you're now playing up to something you, you aren't, who you're not really that person. So it might be a fancy car. It might be acting a certain way in public. It might be going out to bars and, and you know, um, having your ego boosted. Whatever it looks like, all of the things that you see on social media, on highlight clips, on in the, in the tabloids, in the newspapers, it's a dangerous space to put yourself because the minute you start to perceive yourself in that light, even as an aspiring young high school player, um, whatever you're seeing on TV, whatever you're seeing um, on social media, it's a dangerous place to put yourself. So just for me, I think there's always a duty of care to the player and, and that, that journey of self-discovery, of self-awareness becomes a really critical piece because how you perceive yourself it's going to manifest itself on the field as well. Um, and it, it's very easy to, well, I, I certainly went through this. It's very easy to lose yourself for the wrong reasons. Um, and it took me a while to come back to who I really was and embrace that. And I think you can even see from my stats how inconsistent I was as a young player compared to 25 onwards. So is there is there a piece of what you've helped developing your players, Ken, that, that kind of focused on that becoming more self-aware as a person? Well, I, you know, I think that the challenge for today's society, the young people, is there's such a strong desire to want to fit in and be like the masses and everybody else. And uh, I, I, in fact, I just had a conversation. One of my uh, former players recently asked me a question similar to that. How do you, you know, how do you become great? What is the ingredients? What does it take to really become great? And, and the reality of it is you have to distinguish yourself. You have to be okay with being different. You have to be okay with not lining up with the masses because if you want to be top of the five, in a top 5% in the world in whatever you're doing, you're going to have to be different. You're going to have to have a significance that is different than everybody else. It's when you're pursuing and you want the acceptance of the masses and you want to be in the middle of that, again, seeking comfort rather than significance. 
that's the challenge and it's hard. And, and what, what we try to do in our environment and in the culture we created is to, um, is to communicate of how important it is that if we wanted to achieve something that nobody else has achieved at the University of Louisville, we were going to have to do something different and then act different. And if you don't want to chase something big, then fair enough. But if you do, then it takes something different. You can't line up with everybody else at that point. Yeah, it's, it's great again. And um, Ken, I, I think un, unscriptedly, I think that leads nicely into uh, to, the, to the next question, just transitioning back to, towards coaches, um, but on a similar, you know, a similar idea of what Mark's speaking about. I, I do think that that young coaches specifically talk, sorry, more senior coaches speak specifically about the days when they were younger and, you know, they didn't quite know who they are, what they believed in, and therefore their actions and behaviors were reflective of this. And, and maybe they look back and they're like, I probably shouldn't have done it that way. Probably shouldn't have spoken that tone. Um, maybe shouldn't have, it could be ego control. It could be, I'm, I'm in charge. Obviously leadership and what it means has, has definitely evolved over the last couple of decades, but if you could, you know, position this as, as speaking to either your younger self or any of the, you know, younger generation of coaches that, that might be listening, a couple of pieces of advice for them as they kind of enter into, you know, a head coaching role or, a, you know, in, in a club world, maybe even kind of a technical, uh, a technical lead, a director, anybody that's responsible for managing a team of people. I would, I would start by saying this, it's, um, speaking to all the coaches, it's not about you. That your power comes from making other people powerful, right? So it's not about you. And I thought early on in my coaching career at Belmont Abbey, I was uh, leading from a very uh, selfish, um, very um, self-orientated position. It was about my career. It was about championships. It was about my own self-image. And, and the reality of it is you can do that for a short period of time. I actually had a little bit of success in doing it, but you can't sustain it that way. That if you're selfish in your coaching, if you're doing it for yourself, if you're doing it for your own ego, your own self-image, your own uh, championship and awards and recognition, there's not going to be a legacy to it. There's nothing beyond that. And, and eventually people are not going to listen and it's going to be very transparent. You can't build up trust that way. And it was, there was this point I was at um, the University of Akron and we had a season where we underachieved and um, our staff, you know, getting together, uh, we simply uh, decided, ascertained, we reviewing the season. It was because we didn't have good leadership within the team, the players, that the, the older guys, the junior seniors didn't step into those moments. They, they didn't embrace it. They didn't lead in the way that they should have, which put us in a position to not be successful in certain games and we underachieved. And then just days after that, I read an article about Coach K from Duke basketball, and they're asking him about his teams that he had and how much success and the culture, and then especially about the leaders that they had on their team. They said, how do you find all these good leaders? And he said, we don't find them, we develop them. And it was at that point I said, oh my, oh my, it's me. It wasn't them, it was me. The reason why we weren't successful is I didn't, I, my, my eyes were on myself, not on them. And it was my responsibility that I didn't help them be successful in those moments. And it would have this moment where I realized it wasn't about me. And it would change my philosophy. It changed the way I started coaching. I was coaching now from a, a still chasing championships and, and trophies, but it was uh, coaching significance because I was, I was trying to help them reach their potential for us to be successful. It wasn't about me. So that would be the, the first thing. It changed my career. And at that point, my career actually took off. The second part is, it's not about you. And the second part is, it's actually all about you. And here's, here's the paradox of this, is that for you to be able to help them grow, for you to help them reach their potential, we have to grow first. 
that if, if we never dig our well first, we have nothing to pour out on other people. I realized that as I grew as a person, as I grew in my own life, as I grew as a leader, oh my goodness, how much better they got because they were a reflection of who I was. So my eyes needed to be on them, but I needed to take the responsibility to grow daily every single day so I had more to offer them. And the deeper my well, the more I could offer. And how that combination of me taking the eyes off of myself to help them reach their potential and me taking the responsibility for my own growth so I can help them, those two things together as a young coach, I think are critical that they understand that so that they can ultimately help people reach their maximum potential. Incredible, thank you. Um, and again, it, it, it leads kind of into what is really gonna be the, the, the final one of, of my kind of pre-prepared questions. So I would, to coaches or players, please get thinking if you have anything specific that, that you want to, to ask. And obviously the, the, incri uh, the incredible insight that we're, we're being blessed to listen to is, um, we're in, we're in a, well, we're having a treat, aren't we? So uh, let's, if you've got something to, to ask, please, please take this opportunity. But um, yeah, Ken, look, I, again, it, everything that you've said, uh, um, their characteristics and their, their personal qualities and, and values that, you know, I and, and Mark and a lot of, you know, I know firsthand a lot of the people on the call, you know, share, um, but speaking specifically to the players and the coaches about obviously the unique moment that we're in. So you've spoken about filling your well, and I think that can go obviously both both to players and coaches, but how how should people be taking this very unique time to, to upskill? Um, we've used the phrase separation season, both when speaking to players or, or to coaches, because, you know, it's probably going to be a period of maybe 10 weeks or more from when we last stepped on a field together to when we return. Um, and hopefully if the same types of characteristics and, and values that that you spoke of earlier are witnessed, then we'll be coming back better versions of the people we were when we left. So what, what could they be doing um, right now? Is there something that you wished you perhaps had the opportunity to learn about sooner that you that you didn't and wish you could have gone back? Um, just, you know, basically, what, what can they be doing so that whether you're a player or a coach, when you return to the field, you're ready to, to crush it? Yeah, it's a great question, Tom. I appreciate you asking it. Um, what, you know, it's interesting because I found myself when I resigned from uh, Louisville, uh, Tina and I, my wife and I, we really weren't sure what we were going to do next. We, we, we didn't have um, a go-to. So uh, we had uh, weeks, uh, maybe a couple of months where for 30 years, I had a real rhythm to my life. I knew what my life was going to look like every single day. And now I, I jump into a life where the rhythm was broken, the order was broken, and I needed to, um, and I, I, welcomed, I welcomed some of the restoration that came in that, but there came a point where I knew I needed to take control again. And there were so many times in my career, I was thinking, man, if I just have a little bit of a sabbatical, a little bit of time, because there were, there were always areas in my life that I felt that because of how fast life was going, there were certain habits I had neglected that I maybe for a day or two, but not really instituted into my life on a daily basis. And I realized once I, I caught myself, got my bearings, got my feet under me again, that I decided that there were certain habits that I was gonna live by on a daily basis, right? And I, I had good habits as a coach, but now I got to renew them and, and restore exactly what I wanted. And, and you know, when you look at successful people, there's certain things they're doing period all successful people do certain things and and if you you can deny that you can say oh it's probably not true but they you know they things like they get up early in the morning they make their own bed they they exercise daily they they have alone time meditation time they read on a daily basis you know things like that that people you know that successful people do period in all walks of life and there's a reason why there's a top five percent so those are things I think right now of reflecting in on your life of, of what habits that 
that on a daily basis, you can't compromise because uh, first we make our habits, then our habits make us. We got to get those right first. We got to make sure. So I, that would be the first thing that for players and coaches alike is, is understand. And, and here's another belief. And I would even say this for, for the players, for the coaches, for sure. I was taught years ago to read 15, 20 minutes a day. 15, 20 minutes a day. What I was told by a mentor is if you read for 15, 20 minutes a day, the, the power of that is this, is you'll probably get through about a chapter a day. Most books are 15 chapters long. That, that if you do that, you'll get through two books a month, 24 a year. And if you did that, they said for, 40, for, for four years, that you'd be in the top 5% of whatever field. They said for four years, if you did that for four years straight, they said the power of that is you could read in two weeks what it took somebody a lifetime to figure out. So you can leverage your time by learning from other people for 15, 20 minutes a day. And I said, man, I can do that. I can find 15 or 20 minutes in my day. I know I can. And I believed it. And it's one of the reasons why I'm on the call today is because uh, it's, it's not my information, but it's me learning from other people and simply then adapting that into my life. There's a power in reading from good books and good information, right? The next thing is, especially for the coaches, it's the same thing with mentorship. There are a lot of people out there that I'm sure everybody would want to learn from. There was a point in my career, I was at Belmont Abbey College, and I called up Bruce Arena. He was at DC United, didn't know him. I didn't know him, but I called him up and I said, listen, can I come watch your work? And what do successful people say? Of course, successful people want to share with you why they were successful. So now's a time where there's a lot of people that guess what, especially in this profession, they have time on their hands. What do they want to do? They want to share why they're successful. So can you now as coaches reach out to people, people you admire, people that have the fruit on the tree, right? That you want something, you want to be that someday. Can you reach out to them and grow in that area? Because again, we grow in, in one of two ways from our own experiences, which are painful and slow, or we can grow from somebody else's experience, which is a lot less painful and accelerates the growth. The last is, is just improvement in your game. If you're a player, how good can you get with the ball? For me, that is most critical. I was, I was not very big. I was not very fast, but I could, I could touch the ball. I was very technical because I could go out in my backyard with me and the ball, and that's all it took to improve my technical ability. That's it. There's no excuse if you have a soccer ball, you can improve your technical ability. If you improve your technical ability, you improve your value and increase your value as a player, period, period. And that's something that each player can take on themselves. If you have a player and the ball, that's all you need at this point and time, and you got plenty of time, that's all you need. So right now we can increase our value as a player simply by increasing our technical ability. And the last thing for coaches is the professional growth, things like this. What are you doing outside things, that area that because time was so fast and I went through this as well, that the schedule was so fast, I didn't take time to get better in certain areas. And one day I just stopped and I said, listen, I'm going to take the next two, three weeks and I'm going to get good on restarts. It was an area that I neglected for so long. Many coaches do. And I said, I'm going to study it. I'm going to look at it. And sure enough, in three weeks, I felt like I had a better hold on it. And from that point forward, our teams were always one of the best in restarts. Certain areas that you feel you need to grow, can you find those? Because right now, internet wise, there's so much information out there you can get so much and grow so much just from the internet. Thank you, Ken. It's again, fascinating, um, very appropriate, very apt, but, but very inspiring advice that again, I think that just when, Willa, we might dispel this concept in a few weeks when we talk about myths, but uh, numbers don't lie. And when you said there about, you know, the time to acquire new knowledge and the benefit of reading. I think when, when you break it down as simplistically as you just did, it's kind of that aha moment of 
you know, I've got a decision, right? Every day we have a decision as to what we what we find time for. And I know some of the coaches listening have, have made that kind of a, a very intentional professional development, you know, objective is to find more time to, to get better. Um, but like you said, rather do it in a in a few weeks or a, or a month or so than you would a year of uh, struggling and still not right getting to the, to the to quite the same conclusion. So thank you for for that. Um, Ken, we're, we're, we are at an hour, um, but we have had a, a really interesting question actually come through from one of the players that's listening. Um, and this says, if a player suddenly disapproves of or openly criticizes your theories as a coach, how would you deal with that? Well, openly, I'm assuming he's talking in front of the team. Um, and listen, one of the things that uh, we always welcome was honesty, that if uh, people uh, were not sure, did not agree, we much rather have that be spoken than be spoken as uh, spoken in front of us than spoken behind us in closed doors. So I, I don't necessarily think it's a it's a bad thing that for a coaching uh, or a player that that's brought up. It's it's how it's brought up. If it's brought up in a disrespectful way, that's not healthy. But if it's brought up in a very um, respectful, questioning, unsure, can you tell me why? What's the benefit of? Could we maybe do it this way? And we always welcome that because it forced us to to really reinforce what we believed and the reason why we were doing it. So the, the key is, is, is always this, and we said this not only with our staff, but our, our captains as well. When we would have meetings, we would welcome interaction, conflict, because conflict is okay as long as it comes from a place of trust, that everybody's working towards a common goal for the good reason of we all just want to win. We all want to get better. We all want to improve, whatever it is. But if we leave this room, whatever we decide, we all have to be on the same page. And that was the key. It's, it's, it's okay to have those conversations. It's okay to have conflict. But once we decide our course of action, we need to all be on the same page because having the best course of action and split, there's no chance of anybody being successful. And even if we have a course of action that isn't quite the best, but everybody on the same page, we got a chance now. Perfect, thank you. Um, and, I, and I do, Ken, you, you touched on it. It gives us a chance to explain you know, or justify our why. And, and that's a challenge for all coaches, right? Do you know why you do what you do? And if you don't, perhaps you need to, so that absolutely, if a question like that is posed, then it's not it's not posed to be disruptive or, um, you know, confrontational necessarily, um, but it but is born out of a, a true desire to grow that you can, you can use that as an opportunity to help your players learn and, and understand more about why we're asking them to do what we do. Um, Ken, just a, the last one here from uh, from your dear friend as well, Mr. M.A. He said, is there, based on the, the fact that you recommended some books, is there a good one that you could recommend to a, a current high school player who might be looking to go to play in college? Is there anything that fits that purpose? Uh, you know, there's there's a lot of uh, awesome books. Um, you know, one of my one of my favorites is uh, Legacy. Um, it's a culture book and maybe not so uh, specific uh, to an individual player, but I think everybody can benefit from it because there's so many lessons in there um, to be learned as a player and as a teammate um, and just understanding what a successful culture looks like. Um, it's, it's one of my favorites, one of the ones that in sports uh, leadership that I, I give out quite a bit. Um, yeah, I would I would say probably that one right now would be would be one I I would recommend. There's there's a lot of ones just off of it as well. Things like um, I think one of the most um, uh, beneficial ones, the Energy Bus is good. Um, again, another culture one that that we've given out quite a bit. There's a few behind me, but those are more I think leadership ones than individual. Yeah, and Legacy I think it just always if anybody has not yet read it, go and go and find it. James Kerr did a wonderful job there with the insights from the All Blacks and, and the lessons that he shared. And um, I think actually as well, there's, you know, there's some footage. He was a, a keynote at the ECNL symposium over in, uh, over in California this, um, this past winter. So 
if the players want to go and get some snippets there's there's some content there as well but um ken again mark i, I think this one's gone faster than, than all the others to be fair um we're, we're at an hour and, and i'm so grateful for and and conscious of of the time that you've shared you've shared with us today so um on that i i am gonna gonna tie this up and just say obviously from myself and, and mark um all of team beyond pulse everybody listening now and in the future just thank you so much for for the generosity of your time and, and the insight um so many so many great lessons in there for everybody player or coach uh, that one's going to be played on repeat i think a, a few times so um yeah just sincerely thank you ever so much for for joining us today you're welcome thank you so much i appreciate you inviting me on and and for the coaches the players um if they want to contact me uh probably email is the best it's it's pretty simple it's ken at kenlola.com perfect yeah sorry that that's a great one and obviously you're tagged in uh, our twitter post as well for people there who can uh, follow the content that you share so thank you both. Thank, thank you ever so much and uh, everybody else um you guys obviously stay tuned we we have a number of, of upcoming um upcoming webinars for the rest of the week we're joined by john gallucci who's going to be speaking again a little bit more on on leadership but from a player perspective uh, for how you can control your athletic well-being and, and avoid kind of injury on the return to play and then um matt briggs who's at rail salt lake who's going to be talking to how you develop or change your strengths into super strengths and separate yourself from a crowd as obviously kind of as referenced earlier from a from a leadership perspective so um yeah thank you ever so much ken and, and we look forward to, to everybody who's listened today joining us again in the future either live or, or on demand thanks everybody take care <laughs>